Hello, and welcome to the Transformations Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Wiley. And today our guest is Sifu Deng Ming Dao. Deng Sifu is a Chinese American author, artist, philosopher, teacher, and martial artist who from a young age has studied Taoist internal arts such as Qigong and Kung Fu. He is the author of 10 books, including 365 Dao, Everyday Dao, Scholar Warrior, and The Chronicles of Dao. For 13 years, he studied Qigong philosophy, meditation, and internal martial arts with Taoist master, Huan Sai Hung. Deng Sifu is also a graphic designer and a fine artist whose work is in several collections, including those in the Brooklyn Museum. I had the opportunity to speak with Ming Dao back in 2014 about martial arts, Qigong healing, spirituality, and the paradigm of the scholar warrior. Our original 90-minute conversation was lost, however, and it was never released. Somehow, by the powers that be, nearly a decade later, 29 minutes of that conversation suddenly appeared on my desktop from a different computer I didn't have at the time, and there it is. Make of it what you want. During this segment, we discussed many things, including Tao as a path and a way of life, what it means to be of your generation but not imprisoned by it, the importance of cultural literacy, East and West psychology, the Chinese concepts of Jing, Qi, and Shen, how we are part of and not separate from our environment, and even a bit on firearms. I hope you enjoy listening to my conversation with Master Deng Ming Dao as much as I enjoy having you. In your book, The Scholar Warrior, there's a there's a, a statement, every generation seeks to define itself and to find a new way through life. Do you feel that Taoism or the, the philosophies of Taoism help one um, to define themselves, which then helps to oh, help a generation? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a um, there's both a timeless quality about Taoism and yet a whole wisdom about change that goes through nice. there. So mm-hmm. I think Taoism gives you a rubric, a framework by which you can understand is archetypal and primal in life, mm-hmm. what's temporary in life, and how important it is to change and adjust to what happens within each generation. So the very simple idea of Taoism being a person on a path and Taoism also being the path of life and right. trying to get the two of those to mesh up is for me a, a very powerful idea. And so while you still have to have a sense of where you're going and a sense of initiative, you also have to come to terms with the circumstances around you. Look at the possibilities that are open to you and then work with that. Now, those possibilities change. And, you know, you're, you're a father. I'm a father of a, a now 20-year-old. And, mm. I, I'm, you know, you know that our kids are forever <laughs> reminding us how out of it we are. Yeah. And I mean, that's just one very informal measure of how each of us is in his or her own generation. What do you do about that? What do you do with everything around you changes? I, I tell you, when I go to events that interest me, everybody is gray haired. Right. If I go to a right. jazz show or poetry <laughs> or art and so yes. on, I, I am in my generation. I, and then I would look ridiculous at a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> right, um, with a skateboard. So, right, right. So you do have to be a part of your generation, but I don't want to be imprisoned by my generation. Mm. You know, I don't want to just be the old man who, yeah, I, I don't know what, you know, social media is or whatever. Right. 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 Um, you know, I, I, I think it's just as important for an older person to be culturally literate about the right. younger generation as the opposite. Mm. You know, you, you might have just seen recently where there was a, a PR firm that stupidly called itself strange fruit and not really thinking about the Billie Holiday song and the, the, Song is about lynchings in the South. 
So that's mm-hmm. an example where a younger generation had no, not enough cultural literacy about what right. had happened, you know, uh, what, 67 years before. Right. So, but it goes both ways. I think it's dumb to, for an older person to just say, oh, that's what young people do, so therefore it's irrelevant. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And our topic is martial arts and, you know, yeah. healing and spirituality. We have to be on top of whatever the latest science is or the latest uh, physio- physiology, thinking, and so on. But if your philosophy is good, it doesn't matter what the discoveries are. You should be able right. to put it back into that framework. Mm. That's one thing I like about Chinese medicine is that uh, it bases its diagnosis on syndrome based on channel and based on excess and deficiency rather than mm-hmm. saying you have migraine headache. They might say, you know, liver yawn rising or something or blood stagnation. Right. They, 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 because each of those manifestations can can come about for, for different reasons, you know. The saying, uh, one cause many illnesses or many illnesses, one treatment. Uh, and it seems with our modern medicine, we t- they talk about identifying a specific disease or ailment. And then, but if people could look, understand, we need to understand the modern, like you were saying, but then apply it back, for example, in Chinese medicine to what are the, the patterns of imbalance and where can that fit? Um, yeah, and if, I would if say it indeed you- can. Mm-hmm. I would say that the traditional healers are also much more uh, cognizant of individuality and individual right. places in the world. And and I did study yeah. Chinese herbalism for a while. I'm not an expert by any means. But mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that interested me was that the herbalist said he had to use different herbs in San Francisco than he did in Hong Kong. Right. Because the climate was different. Uh, the environmental influences were different and so on. And he also talked about how the thinking of people was different in the United States. And so the psychological and then the link between psychology and uh, um, physiology was different than in Asia as well. Right. So instead of saying, okay, there's one clinical standard and that should be, quote, scientifically scientifically objective, so therefore we don't look at all these other external factors, it actually is more sensitive in looking at the individual factors that are uh, affecting a particular patient. And I think that's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Indeed. You have a comment that Taoist life is deeply spiritual, and they define it as rooted in the body and rooted in life itself. I was wondering if you can... um, Talk about that concept for a moment, and then I have a question to place on top of that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the path that I follow is one that sees a continuum between the coarsely physical and the highly defined spiritual. And that continuum is a, a single unbroken continuum. So mm-hmm. what you do in terms of where you put your foot, how you walk, what stance you take, is on the same line as what you believe, your morality, your sense of who you are, your consciousness, and so on. All of that can be shown to be connected in a uh, a linear fashion, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So you can go from very coarse physical to very, very high spiritual. So therefore, Taoism is rooted in the physical. They don't see... um, a disconnect between the body and the mind. And so even even if they say for the sake of uh, analysis or teaching that there's something like Jing, Qi, and Shen, uh, or that you do have a body and you do have a brain, and, you know, of course, and they talk about your organs, you know, of course they, they will talk about anatomy and so on, but nobody pretends that the liver is unnecessary just because right. they can identify a liver. So no one will pretend that the body and the mind are not connected just because you can talk about them, you know, separately, right? Right. So therefore, your spirituality is rooted in the physical, is rooted in the world. If you understand chi, you understand that chi not only refers to your personal chi, your breath, your energy, your vitality, and so on, but it refers to the chi of the world, the weather, the wind, uh, the energy that you get from the sun, and, and so on. So therefore, 
your spirituality is not only rooted in your body, but it's rooted in your environment. And are we, therefore, separate from our environment? Are we individuals running around and saying, yes, it's me, king of the world? Or are we part of a larger system? And if you look at a Chinese painting for, uh, you know, just as a metaphor, you notice mm. that uh, there's a little person down there. It's never, here's a portrait in the mountain is small and back. Here's a person right. in the mountain is looming and enormous with waterfalls and heaven and, right. and all the clouds rolling. We are, the Taoists don't see us as, hi, here I am. Mm. I'm a discrete individual. Rather, they see you as part of a system, and I suspect that Chinese medicine sees you the same way as well. Right. So your spirituality is no different. Your spirituality is not the spirituality of your personal gratification, but of you in this world, and you cannot be divorced from this world, and the world cannot be divorced from you. Therefore, your spirituality has to be rooted in the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you think that Marsh, uh, you have another a, a statement that all aspects of daily existence are valid. Um, yes. And I wonder, to, is it valid? Do you, are you saying that it's valid because, based on the concept that we create our own realities and what's valid for one is, <coughs> is irrelevant to another? Or, or does it not matter what we do? Because as long as we take a spiritual approach to it, um, it can serve us in that way. Well, what I mean by that is that if you deny any part of yourself or your experience, you already create a schism within yourself. And that's mm. very, uh, that's detrimental to what you need to do in life, right? So that's the first mm-hmm. aspect. What have you to refer to except your experience? And what I find objectionable about some philosophies and some sciences and so on is that they deny the reality of what you experience, right. all right? And at the same time, it's also a reference to a, what I would say, a misinterpretation of Asian philosophy where they say all the world is illusory. So then that can easily lead you to think, well, hey, nothing matters, right? They right. don't mean that it's illusory in that it's all like invalid. What they mean is that the that your sense of its importance and meaning is personal and subjective, not right. inherent in the physicality of the object. So um, someone who sees a chair upside down and doesn't recognize it doesn't see a meaning to it. Right. Whereas, you know, most of us who see a chair standing on its four legs look at it and say, oh, chair, right? right? So, but the, that physicality for the first person when the chair was upside down and they didn't recognize it, the physicality didn't carry any meaning to it. Mm. So I think it's important when you're talking about spirituality for people to evaluate and accept their own experiences in the proper way. Mm. You have nothing on which to base your philosophy except your own experience. And if you let the academics tell you otherwise, you'll be lost. At the same time, you have to realize that your experiences are subjective and meaningful primarily to you. You can't expect the next person to place the same importance upon, say, martial arts, for example, as you do. So that it coming to terms with the... Um, intricacies of that I think are very important. You have to accept Mm -hmm. your own experience, but you have to understand it in a way that is not, um, not, um, I guess, dogmatic um, and has a sense of permanence about it. So you say that the scholar warrior uses specific practices involving body, diet, breathing exercises, herbology, philosophical study, meditation to open the way to the Tao. Um, Could you just briefly discuss um, that comprehensive study for a moment? Yeah. Um, And then um, I'll ask you a question based on that. Sure. My teacher would say the first task of anyone beginning on this kind of scholar warrior path, this idea that the physical and spiritual are one. Mm -hmm. The first task is purification. 
That's purification of the body and the mind and the emotions. The Taoists feel that um, people um, are imbalanced, right. that because of education, because of their daily problems, because of bad habits, uh, food, drink, drugs, uh, what have you, stress, people are imbalanced. So the first idea is to purify the body of its toxins and its, um, its problems, its illnesses, and to obtain balance. The Taoists feel that if a body and a mind are balanced, then your perception of what is spiritual should be automatic. We are meant to understand the Tao, but we are prevented from doing so mostly by the problems of our modern living. So the first problem is to purify ourselves, to clarify ourselves, and to obtain balance. And this is very much in line with the idea of Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine says that if your qi flows, if all your channels are open, if you are in balance, then you're not likely to become ill because illness is defined as an imbalance, uh, a blockage perhaps, or a uh, entry of a malign influence, right? Once you do that, then the idea is how can you channel the energy through areas of the body that are not normally used by an average person, all right? And that's where you get to the idea of um, for example, the eight, what are called eight extra meridians or eight psychic mm-hmm. meridians, you get to the idea of the Dante. So, you know, a normal person or a person who doesn't practice, these channels and centers are not open. If you can send energy through these channels, if you can open these three centers, then each center uh, releases, if you will, a, uh, a power or an energy, a perception, and so on. So we talk about the three Dante. You know, the lower dantine is sort of storage of your uh, basic energy. The middle dantine is your vitality. And the upper dantine is what, you know, we often call the third eye. And if you can open that up, then, you know, the perceptions come to you. Again, the theme is that spiritual perception is not a matter of getting an idea or accepting some thought. It's a matter of you attaining a psychophysical state through the opening of these centers, then you can start to experience all these things for yourself. That's where the exercises and the meditation, the qigong, the daoyin come in. Mm. Next stage is can you build unusual levels of energy? And so if you practice martial arts, you know that a martial artist is capable of feats of strength and power, endurance and stamina, than an average person doesn't have. Why? Because that person trains, right? They're not, they weren't born superhuman. They don't have anything extra. They made themselves that way. And that's where training comes in. So now if you have the channels open, you have the centers open, can you then start to manifest an extraordinary level of energy and to power those centers and to continue your investigations and so on? Then comes finally the the philosophy. You know, when you're having these experiences, how can you shape that into a coherent set of thoughts? And that's where studying the masters and the uh, records that they left behind over thousands of years can help to shape what you're experiencing. If you can do all this, if you have everything from the physical um, to the energetic, to the mental, the spiritual, the philosophical, then you enter that stage of meditation where you can really um, perceive these things for yourself and ultimately glimpse what they would say the uh, aim would be, which would be understanding void or nothingness. Um, And (laughs) that's why in meditation you try to not blank out per se, but just attain that state where it's a thoughtless state. Right. And that thoughtless state is akin to the ultimate reality, the origin of the world, and so on. If you can experience that for yourself, then your whole philosophy becomes grounded in your own um, perception and not simply the words of other people. So that's mm-hmm. a very quick overview of what that's about. I know there are quite a few different martial disciplines where the practitioners feel like 
they are um, finding spiritual moments or moments of no mind in the practice of their sets or in the focus that they use mm-hmm. when doing their mm-hmm. techniques. But do you mm-hmm. think that these are, without having the additional deeper level practices, the, the meditation and the Qigong, et cetera, uh, do you think it's limiting the extent of that experience by merely practicing the physical art? I don't think it's limiting it per se. It's just that there are other things. If they right. stay there, then that's then you know you could have something else. Is, is what I'm saying. Right. But you know there are plenty of people who only want to get to the uh, level of, um, of physical power. Right. Um, they want, and even if they want to attain that very high level of, say, being able to go into a fight with 20 people and not thinking about it and everything is just happening by itself, and of course they still win. Um, Yeah, that's very much akin to spiritual understanding, but it isn't the full spiritual understanding yet. But they don't want to do a goal fighter. That's that's what they aim for, and and that's all they want. I don't think that that's enough in life, but that's my personal opinion. Um, And there's always a danger, and here's just one quick example to show that it is a, a limited viewpoint is mm. how do you keep from feeling pride right. and egotism in your ability? If you are one of those masters that say, yeah, you know, 10 guys, whatever, I'll see right. you at lunch. <laughs> right. Be old soon. Um, Over and then I that's eat it. Sandwich. Yeah. That's right. Um, you get know, stuck in the ego. Right. You get stuck in that. And you also, if you follow that kind of martial life, there's never an end to people gunning for you. Mm-hmm. And so, m- not my Taoist teacher, but one of my other Tai Chi teachers, he, um, you know, followed a master in Hong Kong, and that master, you know, was a famous master, Wu Sao Tai Chi, was unbeatable. And one day, outside a tea house, 10 guys with iron bars and knives caught him. Mm-hmm. And he did beat most of them. But he almost bled to death too. Mm, so yeah. it's like you can you can be as uh, you know high level as you want, but you know if you live a life where you are just dueling day after day after day, you know sooner or later you're going to get it. It mm-hmm, doesn't matter who mm-hmm. you are, right? Right. And um, yeah. you know, and if you love these stories about martial arts teachers and so on, you can't tell me all of them live to old age, right? <laughs> right. So right. it's, it's not right. it's not the best life really. The, yeah. the, um, the attainment is enviable, right? right? But you have to, as a martial artist, you have to ask yourself, how do you live a you know a, a safe and peaceful life, and still right. pursue the standards that martial arts holds up so so loftily? That's just it. You don't want to be dueling when you're sixty or seventy or fifty. Oh well, yeah. But you yeah. still you still have to overcome. The human condition and and your own mind and your own self doubt right. and have a which, quality which, of life, right? Which is far more horrible and far more scary than anything you're right. going to face in a ring. And nobody's yeah. out there when you're having your problems and no one says, "Oh, three minutes rounds up, take a rest." Right, right. <laughs> right. right. It's just, right. It just comes at you day after day after day after day. Unstoppable. And, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. a greater challenge and a more important challenge. I think. I think. Maybe we can draw a, uh, a correlation there between your use of the of the term self cultivation versus maybe uh, skills cultivation. You know, between these two things, the martial artist who merely trains for the physical, the timing or the speed or the strength, is cultivating a skill but not really cultivating the self. I think it's I think it's important to have as many skills as possible. Right. But do you ever let that lead you to insight? So right. just to take it out of martial arts for a minute, let's say yeah. you're a great healer and, you know, you heal people and you cure them of cancer and so on. There's the kind of healer who would then say, hey, I should be famous and make a lot of money to right. heal people and never have any sense of who he or she is. What we want in traditional standards is to use our professions to show us a deeper insight, not only into the profession but into ourselves and the human condition. That's mm. far more important. Self-knowledge, yeah, understanding. Yeah, far more important. Mm-hmm. You know, I was once, I'm a, a graphic designer by, 
by trade. Mm. And I was doing a brochure about cataract surgery. And mm. they brought a, a surgeon in because, you know, we had to understand the hood. And he to say, if, we're like gunslingers. And, and right. we want to, you know, if we can get this procedure, we did this procedure in 6.7 seconds. Tomorrow we're going to try to do it in six seconds. <laughs> right. Okay. right. <laughs> you talk about Break the four-minute mile. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's just like, so it's not a really, at that point, it's not about patients and helping them see. That's like almost incidental to what he was right. interested in. Mm-hmm. And that's, mm-hmm. it's like someone who only wants to go out and kill people to kill people. Right. You know, it's, it's like, what's the point? I like your comment, uh, your statement, um, uncertainty of the future inspires no fear. For whatever happens, a scholar warrior has the confidence to face it because we, we were just talking about the human condition versus just 10 opponents, you know, <laughs> just mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But by practicing these multiple methods of self-cultivation and self-knowledge uh, and taking a more spiritual path, then you can always find that center. You always find a way to deal to a subject. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, uh, you, know, it's, it's, you can control it's, it's, your mind and your ego. Yeah, it's been almost 30 years since I wrote that. So uh, yeah. I changed a little in my thinking, but mm-hmm. what that was originally a reference to was a scholar warrior tries to have so many skills that no right. matter what happens, you know, he or she has a solution for it. If you right. have a solution for it, it doesn't matter what happens to you. It's just like, okay, right. this now. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I got something for you. What I would right. say to you now, almost 30 years later, is that mm. I think that you have insight into yourself. The one thing that I didn't contemplate back then is that sometimes you accept <laughs> that you may have to make a sacrifice mm-hmm. or that something is going to hurt you, you know, uh, in order for right. you to prevail, uh, or that sometimes you just have to manifest a great amount of patience before something right. is resolved. So. You know, there was a kind of um, well, cockiness to that, to the motivation for that statement, because I, I think that's what a scholar warrior is. It's he, he or she says, that, yeah, I don't care what you do. You can ask right. me to quote the classics. You can ask me to ride a horse. You can ask me to shoot an arrow. I do it all. Mm-hmm. But right. there's this other level when you're older. You see, well, sometimes maybe you have to do what isn't skillful or wasn't apparently skillful isn't an immediate solution in order to prevail in the long run. You know, we read these books and talk to the old, the old masters, many of which have passed on now, and they always talk mm-hmm. about a lifetime is not enough to master an art, and, mm-hmm. and uh, or at least yourself. And you're saying, okay, 10 years is nothing to practice because mm-hmm. they knew that human skill was responsible for them winning, you know, with their mm-hmm. spear and their sword mm-hmm. or their gongfu. Mm-hmm. But now with this firearm, boy, things have to change a bit. So the focus of martial arts, um, you know, after, in the 19th century had to, it couldn't just be about the fighting, right? Do you think, is, is, is that where maybe more of the self-discipline, spiritual aspect came in, into play for it? Or is it just that the fighting took uh, the use on the battleground, I guess, not, not the civilian part, maybe took a back seat? Okay, so so let's see if we can parse this carefully because it's right. uh, kind of a complicated <laughs> subject. If all you want to do is go out and kill people, you should learn how to shoot a gun. Right. And by the way, shooting a gun is not automatic. Shooting a gun well requires as much training as wielding a sword or a spear. And, mm. you know, as we're talking here in 2014 with all that happened in Ferguson and Staten Island and so on, you know, clearly the people who have guns don't use them well, right? Mm -hmm. So just because we shouldn't just say, oh, gun, automatic killing, um, martial arts, a lot of work, one's better than the other. No, really, the people who use guns who are in the business of killing need to train as much as a martial artist. They also need to train as much in principle, morality, um, you know, culture, and so on, because who do you choose to kill? And if you right. talk about, if you listen to some of the interviews of guys who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, they talk about being in a roadblock, cars coming towards them, do they shoot or not? 
It's at right. that moment that we see mm. having a gun is not uh, a cure-all for everything. You still have to have a mind and a hand behind that gun. All right? Mm. So I think in the long run, we're going to see guns as a weapon as much as a spear, a sword, or a knife were, and that the requirements, the cultural, spiritual, and mental requirements to use that gun are actually no different. Now, the question is, do you still train in all the other stuff when a gun is available? And the answer is yes, because my teacher told me the story of a a martial artist he knew who was unbeatable with a spear, but he didn't know how to fight with his hands. Yeah. And <laughs> and so one day he was taking a drink from the well, he put the spear down, that's when his enemies came out and jumped him yeah. and killed him. So right. you're not always going to have a gun, and God knows <laughs> guns jam and, and so on and right. so forth, right? So, um, you know, the other question then is, are you going to be a killer? You know, and I don't think that's really necessary or given to all of us to be. I certainly don't go out and practice with guns. I'm not interested right. in killing people and so on. Right. Um, and so, and if all you want to do is kill people, then yeah, you know, that's something. But, you know, we, um, by every civilized standard, we recognize the necessity of killing and we put as many checks and balances on that necessity as possible. And that's what martial arts is about. Now, whether the moral and spiritual aspect of martial arts came in in reaction to the gun, I I wouldn't agree. Um, I think that that um, combination of spirituality and martial arts movement and so on was there from the very beginning of Chinese culture. And I would just point to you um, the the steps of Yu, Y Yu, the great Yu, one of the legendary emperors. This was right. supposed to be a um, a dance that integrated a shaman with the seven stars of the Dipper. That already indicates movement in combination with spirituality, in combination mm-hmm. with the environment, and so on. Um, and that goes back. I, I don't remember his reign years, but you know, of somewhere I think like 4,000 BC or something. Uh, people, including my master, connect the Tai Chi directly to that tradition of the dance of you. And um, if you think about it, why does Tai Chi have a posture called the seven star steps? Why right. is the sword called the seven star sword? This whole mm-hmm. idea of the differ in, in movement, dance, martial arts, and so on is an extremely old and deep one. Uh, I will also uh, point out to you, uh, there's a poem by Du Fu, um, and i would have to look it up for you. But in it, 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 ostensibly what happens, the main part of the story is he's um, at a party, he gets drunk, um, and he gets on a horse with a halberd. Mm-hmm. And he's having, he, he's having a flashback to his days um, when he was a great hero on the halberd, with the halberd. And he ends up falling and then hurting himself. And then he's chagrined because all his friends come to see him. That's the the gist of the story. But if you look at it deeply, well, okay, you're talking about what some people, uh, the person who would, most people would consider, I'd say, the top three poets of Chinese history in all of Chinese Mm -hmm. history is a guy with a halberd on a horse as an old (laughs) man. Okay. Um, (laughs) You know, that's, that. even though that, detail is there as a happenstance, it's almost more persuasive than it's happenstance. It's just right. mentioned on the side. Um, we know that, I think it was also Du Fu, we talked about seeing the uh, sword dance of Madame Gong, I think I'd have to look that up. Um, and so, therefore, he's talking about this idea of a sword dance at a high culture gathering. Mm. And so, uh, therefore, it was not, there wasn't this, necessarily this separation of martial and military uh, deeply in Chinese culture. We also know that Li Po, who most people would consider the premier Chinese poet, was also a swordsman and fancied mm-hmm. himself as a kind of knight around, going around trying to right wrongs with a sword and so on. So, 
you know, this idea of the scholar warrior is, you know, obviously not something I made up, and it's obviously something very deep in Chinese culture, right. um, and therefore did not happen just in reaction to modernity or to guns. Mm-hmm. 